In the wake of World War II, Jewish ex-servicemen and women who served with the British Army came back after witnessing the horrors of the concentration camps in Auschwitz and elsewhere. They returned to see fascists, like the ones they fought, organising openly on street corners in their hometowns and cities, so some of them decided to continue their fight against fascism and hatred by any means necessary. This is Working Class History. A la mattina Appena alzata Oh bella ciao, bella ciao, bella ciao, ciao, ciao alla mattina Hi everyone and belated Happy New Year. Sorry it's been a while since our last episode, but we've been extremely busy working on numerous episodes behind the scenes, including this one, and uh, finishing a book which should be coming out later this year. Now we don't normally do this, but today we'd just like to start this episode off with a brief appeal. A number of our core team took time off from their day jobs in 2019 to spend more time working on WCH. Spending this amount of time moving forwards is only going to be possible if we get more support from our listeners on Patreon. With a 1,000 patrons, we'll be able to continue investing the same amount of time as we did in 2019. Short of that, episodes may be a bit less regular. So if you can, please consider supporting us from as little as $2 a month. Patrons get access to exclusive content and benefits, like early access to podcast episodes, bonus episodes, and more. So check that out at patreon.com slash workingclasshistory, a link in the show notes. Anyway, with that out of the way, let's get started. Today's episode is the first in a new mini-series about the 43 group of mostly Jewish ex-servicemen and women after World War II who, after fighting genocidal fascists in Europe, came back and fought genocidal fascists at home. We're very happy to be speaking with Daniel Sonnabend, who has spent six years researching the group, and whose book, We Fight Fascists, the 43 group and their forgotten battle for post-war Britain, is out now. It is a fantastic read, and we definitely recommend getting a copy. You can get it from our online store at shop.workingclasshistory.com and from the link in the show notes. To understand the story of the 43 Group, the best place to start, we think, is with understanding the situation of fascism in Britain at the time. And the story of fascism in Britain through most of the 20th century is very much associated with the story of one man, fascist aristocrat, hereditary sir, and sixth baronet, Oswald Mosley. So Oswald Mosley was a British politician who was a member of the Conservative Party before switching benches to the Labour Party, before in 1932 setting up first the New Party, which advocated for radical uh, economic policies following the uh, sort of uh, the Wall Street crash in 1929. But uh, in 1932, the New Party he struggled to find success, and so during a trip in the summer uh, to Italy and Germany, where he saw the successes that Mussolini and Hitler were having with fascism, he decided to import European-style fascism to England. And in 1932, towards the end of the year, Oswald Mosley set up the British Union of Fascists. Mosley was an aristocrat who had cut a dashing, swashbuckling figure. He had a fine moustache, sort of swept back hair, had a very strong sort of sexual magnetism to him. And so he was the perfect sort of figure to stand at the top of a fascist party which cultivated the the cult of the leader and the latent homoerotic desires often found within fascist parties. He was the great hero who would save Britain from economic decline, from the control of the old parties, the old mob, and from the controls of the international bankers and from the threat of the communists. At first, Mosley was not hugely into the anti-Semitic wing of the party. Anti-Semitism was certainly a plank of uh, the British Union fascists from the get-go, but it wasn't necessarily something that Mosley was keen on leaning into. And for the first couple of years, from 1932 to 1934, when the British Union of Fascists was at its most successful, achieving uh, very substantially high membership numbers, which were put on show for the first time really in a series of meetings in the summer of 1934 at the Albert Hall and at Kensington Olympia, where tens of thousands of people dressed in the black shirts of the British Union of Fascists, and their nickname, the Black Shirts, came from their uniform, came to salute Mosley in a meeting that was very much styled on the sort of the Nuremberg rallies and the fascist meetings in Italy and Germany. However, at one of these meetings at Kensington Olympia, there was a 
a considerable anti-fascist presence and there was anti-fascist heckling throughout. And the particularly violent ways that Mosley stewards dealt with these uh, protesters received quite a lot of coverage uh, in the British press. And as a result of sort of these bloody images of these beaten up protesters, the British Union of Fascists lost a large number of members very quickly. And they even lost the support of Viscount Rothermere and the Daily Mail, who had, at one point, a few months earlier, declared hurrah for the black shirts. Previously, in these, in these early years, Mosley found membership from right across the British uh, class system, from working class support, middle class support, and found quite a large number of support amongst the aristocracy and the upper classes. And whilst that spread of support continued throughout the existence of the British Union of Fascists, the numbers declined. And to respond to this decline in numbers, Mosley decided to take the advice of two of his lieutenants, uh, William Joyce, who would later become infamous as Lord Haw Haw, and Neil Francis Hawkins, his uh, director of policy. And they pushed uh, Mosley towards becoming more anti-Semitic and to embracing that sort of uh, part of the fascist philosophy and to, in particular, start focusing his efforts on the East End of London, where there was both a very large Jewish community and a large non-Jewish community. Because the fascists always felt that when there was both Jews and non-Jews uh, mixing in large numbers, that was a recipe for anti-Semitism. And surely any Gentile community living very near the Jewish community would be uh, inclined towards hating their neighbours. And so from 1934 to 1937, the fascists very much focused their efforts on anti-Semitism and the East End of London. Uh, the most famous moment, of course, was the Battle of Cable Street in 1936, where Mosley tried to march his black shirts through the East End, but was met by a coalition of Jews, socialists, Irish dock workers, and other East End locals who came together to blockade the streets and to stop Mosley's uh, men passing. There were actually very few clashes between um, the anti-fascists and the fascists that day, and most of the violence was between anti-fascists and the police. But it was still seen as a significant victory against fascism, and the East End was famously um, covered that night with the words, they did not pass. In addition to Cable Street, there were battles all up and down Britain against Mosley and his black shirts in the 1930s. We plan on releasing a separate podcast about that in future. So this is a very general brief overview of the background of fascist organising in the UK at the time. The Battle of Cable Street is often seen as a major victory uh, for anti-fascists, and it is. But it was in no way a real defeat of fascism, because following the Battle of Cable Street, anti-Semitic violence only got worse in the year that followed. And this is very much the environment that the young Jewish men and women who would go on to form the 43 group were growing up in. They were, at this time, mostly sort of teenagers or sort of children of 10 or 11 or 12 years old, and they were prime targets for sort of these roaming hordes of fascist thugs who were just going around wanting to beat up anybody who looked Jewish. So this became a very tough crucible in which they had to grow up. And in order to survive, uh, they had to be tough. They had to know how to fight. They had to... Many of them became boxers or wrestlers or martial artists because this was a really tough environment. And, you know, they were encountering anti-Semitism from, you know, their first days at school. But the sort of... The arrival of the fascists and the black shirts into the East End of London really ramped up the anti-Semitism, became a very tough environment for young Jews growing up in the area. One of these young Jewish people was Jules Konopinski, who we're going to hear a lot more from later on in the episode. As the 1930s drew on, and tensions between Britain and Germany increased, British fascists changed tack. As war seemed more and more likely with Germany, Oswald Mosley decided to drop the word fascist from the name of his organisation and become the British Union, who were primarily interested in advocating for peace with Germany and for ensuring that Britain was not driven to war with its natural allies and its cousins. 
And so as war grew closer and closer, and then in the early days of the war from uh, September 1939 until May 1940, the British Union sold itself as a peace movement, primarily inclined with ensuring that Britain did not go to war and formed a strong relationship with Germany. As a result of this, the, uh, the British Union uh, held peace rallies and they sort of lobbied and advocated against war and against perceived war among us like Winston Churchill. There were many within the sort of British intelligence establishment who saw that the fascists could, when war broke out, uh, pose a serious fifth column threat, both by undermining the morale of the British people and if there was to be a German invasion, they would they believe the fascists might try and sabotage British defences or find other ways to help the Germans. At the start of the war, uh, in September 1939, Defence Regulation 18B was passed. This allowed the government to intern without trial anyone they deemed to pose a real significant uh, fifth column threat within the country. At first, this was no more than a dozen people who were deemed to pose this level of significant threat, and very few people were, round were rounded up. However, in May 1940, following an incident called the Kent Volkoff Affair, in which an American cipher clerk called Tyler Kent uh, was trying via a Russian emigre called Anna Volkoff, who he'd met via an organisation called the Right Club, which was a deeply anti-Semitic uh, fascist organisation uh, run by a conservative MP called Captain Ramsay and which had at its most of its members people in the highest echelons of British power and the British aristocracy. They plotted to take these uh, ciphers from diplomatic communications from Roosevelt to Churchill and pass them on to Lord Haw Haw in Germany with the hope that in doing so these would stop the Americans entering the war if these communications were made public. Fortunately, the British intelligence services, MI5, had infiltrated the Wright Club and knew of the plans, and this gave them the evidence they needed to show that fascists in Britain pose a serious fifth column threat. And as a result, on the 23rd of May 1940, Winston Churchill authorised the expansion of Defence Regulation 18b. Oswald Mosley was then interned, and his British Union was officially banned at the end of the month. By the end of 1940, over a thousand fascists had been interned and were being held without trial in camps around the country. Uh, the largest was on the Isle of Man, uh, but there was also a camp on uh, Ascot racecourses, uh, an abandoned circus training facility was turned into a camp, and there were various other camps dotted around the country where uh, British fascists uh, were held together without trial. Uh, because it was deemed that in what was then appeared to be a highly likely threat of German invasion throughout 1940, that were the Germans to be successful, uh, the fascists would find ways of helping or assisting them. On a related note, it wasn't just British fascists who got interned. Thousands of Germans, Italians and Austrians were interned as well, um, particularly shamefully including thousands of Jewish refugees from Austria and Germany. This was despite the fact that the Jewish refugees were designated as Category C, meaning that the government considered they posed no threat whatsoever. In one internment camp on the Isle of Man, over 80% of the internees were Jewish refugees. Many of these refugees were in turn deported to Canada or Australia, some of them on ships which were sunk by German U-boats, and others were robbed of their possessions by British military guards. Upon their arrival in Canada, over 2,000 Jewish refugees were interned once again in labour camps. But that's a whole other sorry story. The British government did not intern the fascists to re-educate them. They were interned purely as a security measure. And the vast majority of the fascists were held with each other, which meant that fascists only had fascists for company. And so they could sit around and while all of the way their days, stoking the flames of their own zealous politics and all agreeing very much with each other that clearly the source of their predicament and the reason why they're behind bars, and why the country is at war with their natural allies, was obviously the force of the Jews. Because who else could be at fault here other than the Jews? And that the Jews quite clearly controlled the old parties, they controlled Winston Churchill and all of his cabinet. And so, as the fascists were held longer and longer in internment camps, their hatred of the Jews and their commitment 
uh, to their own political cause only grew. As the war went on and the threat of Nazi invasion diminished, the government felt that domestic fascists were less of a threat, and they began to release lower-risk internees. And from its peak of around over a thousand fascists interned in, uh, by the end of 1940, uh, those numbers began to uh, uh, decline. Mosley himself uh, was released in November 1943, as there was a fear that another winter held in Holloway Prison, uh, where he was being held with his wife, would kill him. And Churchill had no desire to make a martyr of Mosley. And towards the end of the war years, 1944, 1945, only the most dangerous fascists were being uh, interned, and the vast majority had been let out. During the war years, um, fascist organising was obviously prohibited, and whilst there were some attempts to create organisations which could emerge after the war, most of these sort of fell through mostly due to infighting amongst the fascists. Mosley himself was, uh, after he was released, uh, was confined to his uh, country estate. He wasn't allowed to have any communications with his followers. He wasn't allowed to engage in any political activities. So they were all his followers. His his former senior lieutenants were all sort of second-guessing what they thought he might want them to do. Uh, The only organisation that had any success was one called the 18B Detainees Aid Fund. And this basically uh, was set up supposedly to give support to those families where a member uh, of the family was being interned, but really acted as a network to keep all the fascists connected during the war years. In November 1944, a new fascist organisation that nobody had ever heard of reared its head. It was called the British League of Ex-Servicemen, and it was uh, announced itself to the world in two weekends in November in 1944, where two former foot soldiers in the British Union of Fascists, a man called Geoffrey Ham and a man called Victor Burgess, erected a platform at Speaker's Corner in Hyde Park and began to advocate for politics and policies that nobody had heard since uh, the fascists had been interned in 1940. Now, it's probably worth mentioning here that while it was called the British League of Ex-Servicemen and Women, Ham and Burgess weren't exactly war heroes. Burgess served in the Middlesex Regiment for eight months until he was interned for refusing to wear his uniform, and Ham enlisted after being interned, but was identified as a disruptive influence in the army and kicked out. They were met first with shock that such people were advocating for these policies and then on the first week after a few minutes of ham talking uh, the crowd sort of got together and pushed him off the platform. Uh, The following week Victor Burgess was on the platform for only a few seconds when a communist contingent who were very much ready and waiting immediately came and smashed him off the platform. This organisation, the British League of Ex-Servicemen, was not in fact originally a fascist organisation. It was founded by a man called James Taylor who had fallen out with the British Legion in Birmingham and so created this organisation to advocate for the pensions of veterans and ex-servicemen. And Burgess had proposed to Ham that they set up a London branch and use it to, as they said, bring Mosley's name back to the streets. Although uh, these first speeches were met with violent response, uh, this did not deter these two young fascists. And Ham in particular, in the spring and summer of 1945, began taking a small platform to various street corners around West London and address passers-by. Sometimes he would get a small crowd, sometimes they would be interested in what he was saying, other times he met with heckling or Jewish residents who would sort of castigate him for his politics, and sometimes he found himself addressing empty street corners. However, uh, towards the end of 1945, Ham began to get a decent-sized following. The membership of his organisation grew, he attracted a group of former East End BUF thugs, who very much became his foot soldiers, and he even attracted a few more middle-class members Uh, who he would have round for meetings at his flat in Notting Hill. He also was very much able to take control of the league and eventually, the following year, push Burgess out completely. And Burgess would go on to form his own organisation called the Union of British Freedom. So in the winter of 1945, 
ham uh, became an increasingly common presence, uh, first in West London, and then he ma- moved towards Bethnal Green and began holding meetings in the fascist old stomping grounds in East London. Two other things in uh, December 1945 showed that the fascists in Britain were not as dead as people would have liked, and that anti-Semitic prejudice was still very much a feature of British life. The first of these was a Christmas party held at the Royal Hotel in London in December 1945, where over a thousand fascists and followers of Oswald Mosley and former 18B detainees uh, came together at a Christmas party to salute Mosley. When Mosley appeared on the stage, he was welcomed with Sieg Heils and sort of other Nazi salutes. He he was hailed, hailed Mosley, and there were plenty of anti-Semitic cries, chants and cheers. And this party got quite significant coverage in the British press and showed the people that the fascists were very much still present and there might have only been a small number of them but their political zealotry had not died down far from it they still held very strongly to their beliefs um, no matter what had happened to their uh, political cousins in uh, Europe. The second incident in December 1945 was called the Hampstead Anti-Alien Petition where in the middle class leafy North London suburb in Hampstead two middle class women Uh, set up a petition calling for the removal of uh, refugees from houses which should be given to returning ex-servicemen. The text of the petition had no anti-Semitic content, but the campaign that surrounded it was deeply anti-Semitic. People were harassed in shops to sign the petition, you know, being told that they had to get rid of the filthy Jews, and some of the letters to the local paper were deeply anti-Semitic. And as a result of this campaign... Geoffrey Hamm uh, became involved in the petition and also began holding meetings at Whitestone Pond in Hampstead. So by the end of the year, it was clear that whilst many in Britain would have liked to have thought that anti-Semitism was dying away, it was clear that it was still very much a presence in British political life. Today, many people are often surprised to hear about how widespread anti-Semitism was after World War II, because the general narrative we're told about the war Um, is almost that it was a conflict to stop the horrors of the Holocaust and protect Jewish people. But this is not even close to being true. So we have this belief today that the Holocaust and the Germans' crimes against the Jews were a major motivation in Britain and the Allies going to war with Germany. And that in doing so, the Allies very much took the position of being on the side of oppressed minorities and the downtrodden human life. This was in no way the case. The British went to war to check German expansionism and German imperialism. The Holocaust and what the Germans were doing to the Jews never in any way played a role in the propaganda in sort of the British encouraging the war effort. And it wasn't even until the liberation of Bergen-Belsen in 1944 that the British for the first time really began to come to terms or begin to understand or reckon with or have any form of understanding of the horrors of the Holocaust and what was being done in the concentration camps. Uh, On the day of liberation, uh, Richard Attenborough went into Bergen-Belsen and did a... uh, a recording for the BBC of what he saw. And that was really the first time where the British public had an understanding of what, was, what had happened to the Jews of Europe. As a consequence of that understanding, there was a, a, a widespread expression of sympathy for the Jews of Europe. And there was a, in sort of towards the end of the war and the post-war years, there was a short wave of sort of philo-Semitism and a, as I said, an expression of sympathy. Even with news from the camps themselves coming out, particularly near the end of the war, general understanding of the Holocaust wasn't even that widespread until lots more people started researching and writing about it in the 1960s. During the war and just afterwards, there are a number of specific factors which exacerbated anti-Semitic sentiment in Britain. One was an untrue assumption that British Jews had avoided serving the military, whereas in fact a disproportionately large number of Jewish people served in the British army, 
around 60,000 during World War II, and that's not including tens of thousands of others who served in the armies of British dominions like Canada or Palestine. Palestine was another big issue after World War II. We go into the history of this in a lot more detail in our podcast episodes 17 and 18. But basically, Palestine had been British territory since the defeat of the Ottoman Empire in World War I, and Britain had also promised in 1917 to set up a Jewish homeland in the area. But of course, they never got round to actually doing it. After World War II ended, huge numbers of Jewish refugees fled to Palestine. British authorities tried to stop them, and ended up interning many Jewish refugees in camps on the island of Cyprus. British authorities also bombed some Jewish refugee ships, claiming the attacks were by a fake Arab terrorist group. The sight of Holocaust survivors being interned in camps once more, this time by the British, helped set public opinion against British policy in Palestine. And so in the end, large numbers of Jewish refugees did end up settling there. Britain's failure to set up the Jewish homeland they promised, combined with everything else, served to provoke a growth in Jewish support for Zionist paramilitary organisations in the area like the Ergun, who'd been carrying out a violent struggle for an ethnically Jewish state in the area since the 1930s. Ergun and similar groups carried out numerous attacks against British installations and forces, and this provoked a significant anti-Semitic backlash against Jewish people in Britain. The whole situation is remarkably similar to our recent predicament in which uh, Western foreign policy in the Middle East provokes a reaction from people who happen to be from one religious group, which then in turn provokes racist sentiment and discrimination against that whole religious group in the West. The final major contributor was anti-Semitic stereotyping around black marketeers. Anti-Semitism was still very prevalent in Britain during the war years. During the times of rationing, one of the sort of the villains of the war was the black marketeer. And there was a, a very quick association that was created between the black marketeer and the Jew. In the vast majority of cases of black marketeering which were put on trial, which were reported in the press, uh, were of Jews, even though Jews were in no way the majority of people who were tried for black marketeering. The Ministry of Food only at the last moment stopped a film about black marketeering, which included the Jewish black marketeer. Uh, anti-Semitic rumours and libels continue throughout the war years. But this was also a period when anti-Semitism or anti-Semitic assumptions were first, for the first time, beginning to be checked or beginning to be challenged. First, as a result of the evacuations of Jewish children, when they were sent to sort of towns and villages across the country, this was the first time that many people had met a Jew for the first time. And whilst there might have been initial questions asking to see the kids' horns, this was a first encounter for many people with Jews. Similarly, many people were meeting in the army were meeting, and the armed services were meeting Jews for the first time. So this was the first time when the British public was coming face to face and encountering Jews outside of the major urban areas in which Jews lived. However, although you have the start, you have the start of that process uh, of the British people really meeting Jews for the first time anti-Semitic biases and prejudices prevailed and were still very much present in the post-war years when rationing was continuing. The stereotype of the SPIV and the black marketeer continued to be associated with the Jews. For listeners outside the UK, and probably for younger listeners in the UK, um, a SPIV is basically a dodgy wheeler-dealer type often associated with the black market. Probably the most famous cultural example of a SPIV is of Private Walker, the guy with a pencil moustache in the BBC sitcom Dad's Army. Jules Konopinski was a Polish Jewish refugee from Austria who managed to escape from the Nazis and was living in East London. You can hear more about his early life and how his family managed to escape to Britain in the bonus episode for our Patreon supporters. Dan and I visited his flat in North London where he spoke about how living with anti-immigrant and anti-Semitic sentiment was just part of everyday life. Unfortunately, when I went to school there in Forest Gate, this, this is a school uh, which is based next to the old West Ham football ground club. The public were very <laughs> apathetic to seeing a boy wearing velvet suits with white socks, short socks, you know, with strange eaton type collar shirts, European style clothing, coming to a school. And uh, from the day I arrived at school, I was involved to protect myself we look after my clothes, my physical being, and I had to learn to um, to struggle to uh, survive. In other words, as a child of, child of 10 or 9 or 10, it doesn't matter how old you are, if you've got people coming after you older than you, 
So it was a daily battle to go to school. And after not many months, the headmaster of the school, seeing my predicament, and me being a bit unruly because I wouldn't, I wouldn't conform, said he, to my mother, he's, we've got an application to a public school, Palmetters, which in those days was at the same level as City of London, Carver Street, Devon and Grocers, one of the, one of the, one of the public school founded and supported by the city institutions. Just a quick note here for American listeners. In the UK, a public school is an elite private school. And I passed the scholarship and I had a free education. My neighbour in class next to me was Harold Pinter, uh, one of the famous footballers, I can't even think of, agree, I can't agree, I can't think of the name. Anyway, Harold Pinter was my neighbour in school and he was with, in my neighbour, well, sitting next to me for about three years till eventually their own school, Grocers, reopened and he went there. And every day going to school in Bethnal Green was an ordeal. There again, I had to walk through an area which pre-war, during the war, was very, very, very fascistly orientated. In fact, there were one block of flats in Russia Lane, there were hardly any men available. Most of them were in prison or in 18B uh, detention. And but walking through there, having stones, bricks, bottles, furniture, it was a daily routine. To such a degree that in order to get to school and get some education without being bothered, myself and another friend, who looked like me, used to walk into Victoria Park, which is where the school was, next to the chess hospital, another chess hospital. They had dug craters at the beginning of the war to stop gliders from landing, German gliders from landing or planes on landing. And we used to climb into one of these pits, take off our coats, and say this, sir, come, come on, boys, this. do it now, at least we can go back to the school then when the bell goes and get some education. So Jules and his Jewish friend would fight it out in Victoria Park, then put back on their blazers and go to class. Being Jewish, coming from a background where, persecution background, we saw it in Germany, we had the feeling, you can feel the, the antipathy. We saw Hitler, we were taught to look away, never look, never, uh, and turn your back. And this was not my personal belief. My parents came from a religious background. I mean, I, I knew, I, I knew my, mother, my mother was the oldest of seven or eight children, and her mother died when, she, when my mother was 10. So she looked after all those kids, and those days kids came every year. And since we found out where they were all buried, there were four more kids that I've never even knew about, because the father had remarried. So it was a, it, we came from a family with a hard background, and although having made their way in life, it was always there. And uh, this is one of the reasons why it prepared us for the problem. Now, I'm in school, I go to a youth club in Hackney, Hackney Boys Club, which is in Hackney, which is on my way from school to home. And I spent a lot of time at the youth club, it was those days, the upbringing for all the people. It was the thing which is missing today for the young people, to do the normal thing that young people do and not pretend to be uh, old people before they're too young. You take a child today of 15, 16, 17, 18, tell them to play table tennis, you know, you think you're mad. You know? But this was a thing today, we enjoyed it. We had competition and this was our life and we were brought up as, as children when we were children. But I already had, had, had to be an adult my mother cried day and night for the loss of her, her family because news was coming through about the atrocities being happening in Europe that unfortunately the government refused to accept or acknowledge. News came all the time because we had Jewish soldiers came through from the Polish army for Anne, from General Anne's army. 
We had Czechoslovakian soldiers, a French here, bringing in news. So, although the world didn't acknowledge it, those of us who knew knew what was happening and that the destruction of the, Jew, of the Jewish race was underway. And so, in a way, we were highly motivated, highly motivated. After the war ended, the situation didn't get any better. And my father worked in Bethel Green, and so I, I had to work in that area. And every day, every day was an ordeal. If your windows weren't broken and the walls hadn't painted, been painted up with Paris Judah down with the Jews, uh, if people weren't standing on, 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 on a street corner shouting out, not enough for guests, and the police did nothing. And if anyone even went to investigate as to what was going on, they were either told to leave, forced to leave, or if they asked too many questions of the police, arrested by the police uh, for any excuse. And it appeared to me, anyway, that the Labour government of the day under uh, Attlee, with a, a Home Secretary Tutor Eid, with a Foreign Secretary Ernest Bevin, and with uh, a, a total mixture of, of, of um, left and right wing, of the, of the left wing Labour Party politicians, was not interested in the problem because their policy was, uh, I think, A, they thought maybe that they lost all their interest and their fervour in the war, having lost it. They weren't supporting a, a victorious, you know, before the war they were looking at someone who was going to be famous. After the war, having had their, lead, their, their, their idols beaten, maybe they thought, the hope checker, they thought that they weren't going to uh, worry about this anymore, it was nothing. And they allowed it, they allowed it to grow and fester and grow. And um, if you read a book by a very, very young, very famous author, one of the first 50 pages, he gives you a very detailed lowdown of how all these organizations slowly and credibly and, and carefully got together, separated, mixed, spread very cleverly, their, their, their tentacles inter, their interlaced with one, with one ideal, form a extremely right-wing administration in this country and to do it through, the, at that time, leader was almost the pre-war leader. The book Jules is referring to here, if you hadn't guessed, is Daniels. And as Jules says, it goes into a lot more detail into exactly how the fascists regrouped after the war. We were a, a nation of people who were suffering from post-war. There's not one family that I know that, that you know, they hadn't lost somebody in the war. Uh, and it's losing somebody as a, in battle, heroically, is bad enough. But when you hear that you've lost 50 members of your family in the slaughter, in the camps, it took a lot of um, digesting. But the British public didn't accept, didn't appreciate that. It didn't mean anything to them. The situation had got so bad that some Jewish people had begun deciding to do something about it. There were some people, and I, at those days, long before the 43 were even formed, was actively countering their demonstrations and doing what I can, and trying to get recruits to help to join us. Now, now comes the period when the soldiers were being demobbed. And you had soldiers who had done either five years in Europe, six years in the Far East, many of them in the, in the prisons of war of the Japanese, prisons of war in Germany, came back to their homes in Hackney, in Bethnal Green, in Forest Gate, in the East End, in Stamford Hill, in Dalston, in Highbury, in Tottenham, and elsewhere, everywhere. And suddenly found this thing going on, but it, most of them, it didn't worry them because they weren't in a Jewish area. 
But if you go back to Hackney or Stafford Hill, and your parents said, oh, be careful as you go out because there's people down here beating up Jews. Or uh, I've got to whitewash paper walls. I've got all these daubings on the walls. I've got broken windows. They said, what the hell's going on? We've done our time, we've served the war, we've done our we've been prisoners of war, we've been wounded, we gained our medals, we got our VCs, we got our military medals and all the FCs. What the hell's going on? And they approached the Jewish organizations who buried their heads in the sands. Because they were more interested, in my opinion, in getting their um, knighthoods. And uh, I don't know what they were interested in. They you couldn't make them out in one way. They were Jews, in one way they were philanthropic. In one way they did uh, a job that they thought was good, but as regard to what was considered, I think, the most important thing, prevent this re-rise, this scourge, they weren't doing their job. From 1945 onwards, when uh, the armies began, and the armed services began to uh, demobilize uh, the vast majority of the armed forces. Many of the um, Jewish soldiers who were coming home for the first time after the war began to notice that fascists like Jeffrey Ham were holding street meetings, they were publishing uh, journals and putting up leaflets and flyers, and even uh, putting up anti-Semitic graffiti in Jewish areas. At the start of 1946, an organisation called the Northwest Task Group attacked a couple of synagogues in North London and also began targeting uh, members of the Jewish community in North London um, and putting up very anti-Semitic graffiti. The returning Jewish ex-servicemen were absolutely appalled that such things were being allowed to happen. They were appalled that the government was going to let it happen. The government had held a, um, a committee into the return of fascism at the start of 1946 and had concluded that fascism in its current form posed no threat and that existing legislation was more than sufficient for dealing with the fascists if they ever stepped too far out of line. And that became government policy for the next couple of years. And for the government, it was much more important in the post-war years that democratic norms and the sort of the pillars upon which British democracy were founded, in particular free speech, that these were returned to and that these were re-established. And so it was more important for them that the fascists had free speech and their, all their political uh, freedoms returned to them than it was uh, to protect minority populations and the Jewish population. So following that, the police um, also did nothing to stop the fascists and fascist activities. And in fact, the fascists could appeal to the police under the 1936 Public Order Act, which had been passed following Cable Street, to protect fascist meetings. And so in the post-war years, the fascist speakers were being protected by both their own stewards and by cordons of police at larger meetings. The Jewish ex-servicemen then turned to their own community leaders. Um, the Jewish community was, is led by an organisation called the Board of Deputies of British Jews. The Jewish ex-servicemen sort of turned to them to see if they would do anything about it. But the Board of Deputies is a very establishment organisation which is more concerned with protecting the, the standing of the Jewish community and the reputation of the Jewish community than it is with um, necessarily, or at least in those days, than it is with protecting the the lives and the safety and the well-being of the Jewish community. Or at least that was very much the impression of the Jewish ex-servicemen. In fact, the Board of Deputies uh, were willing to do things to combat fascism. They put on lecture series, they put out pamphlets, uh, but they also lobbied the government and they had um, quite an effective spy network which had infiltrated the fascists. The organisation that the Jewish ex-servicemen hoped would really take a stand against the fascists uh, was an organisation called the Association of Jewish Ex-Servicemen, or AJEX. AJEX was the association meant to represent them, and many of the ex-servicemen wanted it to take a stand against the fascists. Responding to that, AJEX 
um, who again was connected to the Board of Deputies and so could not break the law in any way because the Board of Deputies would not allow that. But what they did were prepared to do was put on uh, platforms and speakers next to fascist speakers and try to engage them in debate or to just sort of take their audiences. But for many of the returning Jewish ex-servicemen, this was crazy. The notion that you're going to try to deal with a fascist by putting up a platform and debating with them in some way and trying to sort of win over their crowds. You know, you, they'd just come back from Europe and seen, seen the destruction of fascism. They had seen that these are not people who want to engage in reason debate. These are people who want to see you die in gas chambers. So the notion that you're going to stand upon a platform is, as they would say in Yiddish, Meshuggana. There is only one way to deal with fascists, and they've been shown that in the war. You go and you fight fascists, and you have to kill them, because that's what they do to you. So coming back and seeing the fascists on the streets, for these ex-servicemen, the war had not ended. These were the same people. And the notion that everybody, the rest of the, the, the government, the police, the board of deputies, weren't seeing that was shocking, it was appalling, and as a result, the Jewish ex-servicemen responded with horror, they responded with anger, they were outraged. And so they decided that they had to take matters into their own hands. A chance encounter between a group of Jewish ex-servicemen and a group of fascists gave them the inspiration they needed to put their feelings into action. In May 1946, the official story, as told by um, a man named Morris Beckman, who was one of the founding members of the 43 group, is that he and three other ex-servicemen, Jerry Flamberg, a former paratrooper who uh, won the military medal at Arnhem after taking out a German tank single-handedly after he'd been shot in the shoulder, um, Len Sherman, who was a martial arts expert, and Alec Carson, who was a, um, a pilot, were driving from Maccabi House, which was the, um, a, a Jewish sports club in North London, uh, to Jack Straw's Castle, a pub at Whitestone Pond in Hampstead, when, as they were driving past, they chanced upon a meeting at Whitestone Pond of Ham and his League of Ex-Servicemen. They got out of the car, and with Flamberg at the head of them, they took out uh, the four stewards that were guarding Ham, and Flamberg smashed Ham off his platform and beat him up. There are different versions of the story, how many people were there, whether it was planned or not. There is debate over it, but that is Beckman's version of the story. That attack was seen as the template for effective anti-fascist action in Britain in the post-war years. Over the summer of 1946, a small band of mostly Jewish ex-servicemen, there were a few women, there were a couple of non-Jews, there were a couple of uh, people who weren't ex-servicemen, began turning up to fascist meetings, heckling, barracking, and starting fights. And at the same time, they were sort of discussing and playing with the idea of setting up, uh, of, of breaking away from Ajax and setting up their own anti-fascist ex-servicemen's association. And in September 1946, at a meeting at Maccabi House, uh, the 43 group was formed, named after, as one story goes, the 43 founding members in the room. Well, that's it for part one. In part two, we're going to be hearing more about the 43 group and their activities from Dan and Jules. Uh, and we'll be learning about women, LGBTQ people, and the involvement of people of colour in the group. And we talk through some of their violent clashes with the fascists. Our Patreon supporters can listen to that now, and all other parts of this mini-series. Um, so if you can, please consider supporting us at patreon.com slash workingclasshistory. Link in the show notes. For everyone else, part two will be out next week. Relevant levels of our Patreon supporters can also listen to our first 43 Group bonus episode, where we hear more from Jules about his early life and how his family escaped from the Nazis. Link to that in the show notes as well. Again, we highly recommend getting a copy of Daniel's excellent book, We Fight Fascists. You can get it at shop.workingclasshistory.com, and there's a link to that in the show notes too. If you enjoy our podcast, please share it with your friends, colleagues, family, anyone, um, and give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or your favourite podcast app.
As always, huge thanks to our Patreon supporters who make this podcast possible. Thanks also for Dischi del Sole for our theme tune, Italian partisan song Bella Ciao. We recently found out that there was a Yiddish version of this song from the early 20th century, but we couldn't get the rights to it for this episode. But we will put a link to it in the show notes. Cheers for listening, and catch you next time. Oh, bella ciao, bella ciao.